Okay. Well, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, President. Listening to the program and the ambitions took me back 37 years to when I was president of the society and I think we were struggling to get our membership to 500. So it's come a long way. Uh, I'm sure the mathematical minded amongst you will work out the, the doubling constant. Um, but it's a great honour to have been asked to come here this afternoon to present uh, the Dunster Lecture. John, I knew very well indeed, as you can imagine. Um, things you didn't know about John Dunster, or perhaps things you did know about John Dunster. I mean, John was a remarkable individual. He, um, he certainly could think twice as fast as anybody that I've ever known. And he also spoke three times faster. Silence. That, that led to a certain amount of confusion, especially with our international colleagues, as he would change his line of argument halfway through speaking. But very, very great man. The other thing perhaps I would say about John Dunster that, that you may not know is that he um, moved house at least ten times in the years after he retired from NRPB. Um, I, I'm sure he had a permanent estate agent. He, he, was, he and Rose were always moving from place to place. Four times in Oxford, I, I remember, um, in, in Headington, uh, in, in the very centre of Oxford, in the south of Oxford, um, and uh, three times in London, twice in um, Wallingford, and once in East Hendred, near Wantage. So he, he was always on the move, that active mind. But a very great man, and I am honoured to uh, be able to speak uh, in his memory. So I um, will go on now to, to talk about the evolution of ICRP uh, recommendations since in, in its inception. ICLP, as you know, um, was conceived at the 1925 International Congress of, of Radiology, the, the, the beginnings of what had started but was interrupted by the First World War. Um, present at that 1925 conference were Val, Valentine Maynard, Val Maynard, um, who incidentally was the external examiner for my PhD um, a couple of years after this. Um, Laurie Taylor, Lauriston Taylor was there uh, and, and Rolf Sievert who you all know. They each played significant roles uh, in ICRP and ICRU over the years. It was in 1928, 90 years ago, at the second congress in Stockholm that the International X-ray Unit Committee was formed and the forerunner of ICRP, the X-ray and Radium Protection Committee. The most important thing at that time was to quantify the amount of radiation that was being used, especially in the medical field. Uh, dosimetry prior to this had been determined by quantities such as the erythema dose. Uh, the Röntgen was a big, big step forward in that they could actually measure what was being delivered. The first recommendations of ICRP for its forerunner um, had an emphasis really on shielding the, um, they knew what they were trying to guard, mainly the workers and the physicians from. But uh, amongst the recommendations was this rather nice one, a prolonged vacation. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost that over the years. Maybe ICRP should reconsider. Um, the first quantitative uh, 
recommendations on dose limits came in the 1930s uh, with, with restrictions that would be equivalent to about 500 milligray a year now, 25 times uh, current standards. Uh, <coughs> and uh, basically, until the 1950s, the recommendations implied that there was a safe threshold and really no environmental concerns. In 1950, there was quite a, um, a comprehensive list of health effects to be guarded against and the whole basis was still the assumption that there was a threshold below which harmful effects did not occur. That led, as, as I'm sure many, many of you know, uh, a great deal of... Um, a great number of consumer products. You could buy radioactive uh, undergarments to keep you warm when you were skiing, as you can see here. Toothpaste um, to, to give your teeth that extra gleam. Uh, radium in chocolate. Uh, hand creams. And of course, ladies' cosmetics, which were widely promoted. Um, lipsticks, rouges, uh, powders all radium based uh, and I remember when I was a child when my mother was buying me a new pair of shoes I put my foot inside the pedoscope down the end here all the shoe shops in town uh, had these x-ray machines for checking the correct fit of, of shoes especially in children's feet uh, um, Apologies to colleagues who've seen all these sorts of things before. What changed, of course, was the emergence of uh, accelerators, reactors, um, atomic weapons, and, and the fallout therefrom. And uh, it was after the Second World War that the International Society of Radiology, the parent body, asked Laurie Taylor to consider uh, how the old X-ray unit and X-ray and radiant protection committees should be structured for the future. Laurie um, worked with Val Mainyard, and really Laurie Taylor and Val Mainyard were the architects of ICRP and ICRU, um, Mainyard becoming the first chairman of ICRU in 1950 when the proposals were adopted. Laurie, of course, was secretary of both ICRP and ICRU, <coughs> but he gave up those roles later on and, um, of course, concentrated on NCRP in the States, of which he was president for many years. And again, I met him a number of times because in the 70s and 80s, um, even beyond that, when he was around and in his 80s, he turned up at the NCRP annual meetings um, and, and participated. And I, I met him many times, a, a, a real gentleman. But uh, at around the same time, of course, the first excess of leukemias was seen amongst the survivors of the atomic bombings in uh, Japan. And Court Brown and Doll, Sir Richard Doll, um, who many of you I'm sure know of, um, had published uh, reports of an excess of leukemia in the spondylitics, uh, patients who had been irradiated for, uh, ir spi they had their spines irradiated for medicinal reasons. So that uh, it was clear that um, I've done something wrong, President story of my life. I've always been doing things wrong. Right. So, in 1950, having made recommendations which were really um, based on a, a, a threshold, in 1955, they started to worry and made recommendations that all types of exposures to ionizing radiation should be reduced to the lowest possible level. Um, and the problem was to choose a 
practical level which um, presented a negligible risk. I have to say the lowest possible level of course implies regardless of cost and ICRP did change uh, the lowest possible level to as low as readily achievable but that then was judged to be too financially demanding because it, it, it kind of implied if it was readily achievable regardless of cost um, and it was some 20 years or so before we will see in a moment as low as reasonably achievable um, emerged in uh, 1959, the first of the current series of ICRP publications uh, replaced the weekly dose limit that had existed with an age-dependent formula, as I'm sure you know, uh, plus limits for individual organs and maximum permissible concentrations were published which were predicated on the organ dose limit or the whole body limit that existed at the time. There was still at that time concern about the genetic or the hereditary effects of radiation and there was a dose limit for the public designed to, to reduce um, that risk. In 1966 they actually abolished the uh, assumption of a threshold and it was assumed that there was, from then on, a linear relationship between dose and risk. By 1977, they had developed the system of dose limitation with the principles which are well known to all of us of justification, ALARA, and keeping below limits. The Commission did realise it was making ethical decisions in, in uh, making these recommendations, but it considered them to be included in the uh, word social, uh, in the principle of optimization. So they were really pursuing uh, a utilitarian system of ethics, the, the greatest good for the greatest number of people as is shown by the fact that what was to be optimum was when the collective dose was sufficiently low that further reduction wouldn't be worth the incremental increase in risk <coughs> and it was suggested in 1977 that you assigned a monetary value to the unit of collective dose uh, I said a uh, a societal based approach, utilitarian ethics, with the greatest good for the greatest number of people, something which we're quite familiar with. Um, again, you're probably aware, but just to, to reiterate, the collective dose was introduced as a concept at that time um, because in optimization it represented the total harm to people over all time, all people all time. Um, so if you were going to balance costs and benefits this was the, the harm which you were going to uh, cost and, and balance. But the other reason for introducing it was that uh, people, Dan Bennett and Bulindel, came from a period when there had been atmospheric testing of, of nuclear weapons and fallout levels uh, could become quite a significant proportion of, of natural background dose and uh, they were worried that if you had uh, a, an expansion of a nuclear power program and reprocessing then you might have discharges to the environment which would eventually build up and lead to an ever-increasing background of artificial radionuclides. And so they proposed um, limiting the collective dose per unit of electricity generated. This, I think, was only ever implemented in Sweden and Argentina, and Jack is nodding at me, so thank you, Jack. 
Uh, only in those two countries. None of the rest of us did it. And, of course, things didn't go exactly as they might have envisaged. But I just observed that the collective concept, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist in any other field. Any other pollutant or environmental agent, uh, whether it's treated as having a threshold or not, is never collectively added up and used in a way to judge the practice. So it's quite unique in radiation protection and um, I think Roger would probably agree we've suffered from it ever since it was introduced. <coughs> Hello. In publication 26 in 1977, the concept of the critical organ was abolished because it enough was known about cancer risks to be able to produce a weighted dose uh, for the whole body so that risk was the same whether the whole body or partially uh, the body was exposed. Uh, in those recommendations, the Commission introduced the quantity but without giving it a name. It was a year later that uh, following a proposal by the German physicist Wolfgang Jacobi uh, that the name effective dose equivalent which we now call effective dose was introduced. In those recommendations again just just to remind you, there was no consideration of the risk associated with the limits that existed because occupational limits were justified on the basis that the average dose to workers gave a risk that corresponded to the average risk in safe industries. So they're comparing averages and averages and the um, maximum risk w was not given any consideration. Um, that's part of the societal based ap approach really. For the public it was really a very convoluted argument where, where the text says that on the basis of the then risk fig figures uh, one millisievert a year would be the limit for the public but on the other hand five millisieverts per year had been found to give that degree of safety, or this degree of safety. I'm not quite sure what that was, a very convoluted argument. But um, in the following years, through the 1980s, um, there was growing evidence that our estimates of risk from exposure to ionising radiation were uh, low, um, that they should be increased. But I have to say the ICRP uh, response in the 1980s was really to say uh, if you do your optimization correctly there won't be a problem. And I remember the 1987 meeting in, which was held in Como where Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace came to mount protests to say ICRP's risk factors were wrong. Um, and they were really led by a man called Professor Edward Radford, Ted Radford, um, who had previously been the chairman of the U.S. National, National Academy of Sciences Beer Committee, you know, the biological effects of ionizing radiation. He was the chairman, produced the Beer 3 report, which concluded that the risks from ionising radiation exposure were higher than those proposed by ICRP. Um, whatever, he was sacked. The w report was withdrawn and reissued a year later with different conclusions. Ted Radford then moved to the um, environmentalist camp, if, if I may call it that, but the opposition camp and became an active campaigner against ICRP. Um, well, in 1987, the Dan and Boo met uh, Ted, and, and I call him Ted because I, I knew him reasonably well, and 
Actually, I quite liked it. We, we got on quite well. Um, but Dan and Boo argued the optimization case, cost-benefit analysis, mathematical models, that provided all the protection with, that was necessary, and it didn't really matter what the individual risk factors were and the highest risks. Um, and they, they, they had tried very hard to, to argue that way. But by the time we got to the 1990 recommendations, uh, as you know, there was a significant increase in the uh, nominal fatal risk factor. And uh, most of publication 60 was devoted to firstly establishing the biological basis for the risk factors from exposure to ionizing radiation and secondly um, a, a, a very great deal of discussion in the document which was led really by Boo Lindell on acceptability of risk well, how do you judge what is the risk from continuous exposure to an ionizing radiation and against what do you judge it so most of publication 60 was concerned with justifying the dose limits um, that were to be put in place. Try again. Now, uh, allow me, I, you have to go with me here. This was the commission meeting to agree the 1990 recommendations as, as the more discerning of you might determine I was there um, across the back from left from your left to right Giovanni Cellini who was the then UNSCIA scientific secretary Charlie Meinhold um, who became president of the NCRP in the States Itsutsu Shigematsu, who was chairman of RERF, Li Diping um, from the China Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, Julian Linieski from Poland, who chaired committee three at that time. Oh, Charlie, Charlie chaired committee two, if I remember correctly. Across from Julian Linieski is Wolfgang Jacobi, the, the man who suggested the term effective dose equivalent. Um, Fred Mettler, the tall guy there, who later, with me uh, as chairman, chaired committee three. Warren Sinclair, who was chairing committee one on the biological effects at that time. Um, at the very front, on the left, in the bottom left-hand corner, Hilton Smith, who was the then scientific secretary of ICRP, Henri Jamais in the middle, uh, the Frenchman who was vice chairman, Dan Benenson on the right, who was chairman. And uh, in the middle row from left to right, me, John Dunster, uh, Angelina Guskova from uh, the Soviet Union, and um, a, a medical doctor who, in fact, had hands-on treatment for most of the uh, badly affected firemen at Chernobyl. Then Boo Lindell. I think that's everybody. But the interesting part, in a way, was uh, that this commission was completely split about what the dose limit should be. Um, it, it was 6-6 six, six for 50 millisieverts a year, or 20 millisieverts a year. And um, you might like to have a little guess amongst you, yourselves, a guess with yourself, where the 6-6 six, six split, but uh, I will tell you anyway. Um, the three Americans were for 50 millisieverts. That's Warren Sinclair, Fred Methler, and Charlie Meinhold. Um, Henri Jamais from France, that's four. Angelina Guskova from Russia. Uh, and Li Diping from China. That means Giovanni Cellini, myself, John Dunster, Julian Linietsky, Wolfgang Jacobi. Is that six of us? 
one, two, three, he said. Did I say Tsusu as well? The Shigematsu from RERF. The six of us were in favour of 20 millisieverts a year. Dan, I know, wanted 20 millisieverts in a year as a dose limit, but would not use a casting vote uh, on a subject like this. So what happened was that um, Warren, as chairman of committee one, the biological committee, and myself as the then chairman of committee four, the applications, were told to go and sit down and come up with a compromise. And, and you know the compromise. Um, it started with Warren saying, well, my body doesn't know whether it's December the 31st or January the 1st. So there has to be, you know, some give and take about a year. And as they say, the rest is history. But it was an interesting time. Finally, um, it wasn't quite on the 11th day of the 11th month. But it was, well, it was the 11th day of the 11th month, but not at 11 in the morning, if I remember rightly, in 1990, when we all signed to say that we accepted the... Um, 1990 recommendations. So, towards the more modern times, um, because in those 1990 recommendations, which, which are a frighteningly long time ago now, um, little advice was given on optimization, although a significant change crept in, and that was the introduction of the word constraint. Obviously, this formal cost-benefit analysis and not worrying about the risk to the most exposed people um, had to be taken into account, and that was done by constraining optimization. But unfortunately, the Commission didn't give any advice at all um, on what it meant by a constraint and how it was to be used, and that led to a lot of um, discussion in uh, international fora where people were, were discussing how you could use a constraint and what it was meant to be. Um, that may seem unbelievable to you now, but I, I, I attended many meetings, the European Commission or the, um, the NEA, uh, uh, CRPPH of the OECD, where we spent days um, with, with people having different ideas about constraints and did they apply in emergencies or what? And ICRP hadn't really said anything. Well, a slight bit of self-indulgence. Um, by the late 90s, uh, I had become chairman of, of ICRP and um, thought maybe we... We were, it was, the recommendations were a bit like topsy in that they just growed, as if you see what I mean. And so I um, put this paper in the journal of the society uh, and I remember somebody wrote an editorial, I won't say who, um, but the editorial for the society said, I don't know what Clark's thinking about, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, um, in fact, what happened was that societies around the world, and, and probably led by ERPA, I think, Roger, formed working groups to discuss what the direction of protection policy should be in the future. So, for the first time, the profession was involved uh, with the Commission in discussing the way forward, which um, led, as you know, to the 2007 recommendations. Um, it took a long time to get them out, but that's what happens when you go to consultation. It goes backwards and forwards. Uh, but what we wanted to do by 2007 was to emphasise source-related protection because sources are what are licensed, what are um, controlled, we wanted to emphasise constraints and reference levels and de-emphasise limits. 
because constraints and reference levels were what you were going to work to in practice. So we were clarifying this situation-based protection. Um, we re-estimated radiation risks largely based on incidence data rather than fatality data. And we looked at the dose quantities and the use of collective dose. There were two other major concerns when we were coming to make these recommendations. One was the medical exposures field where, where we were worried that they weren't sufficiently well um, controlled, uh, policed, because one saw an awful lot of patients with burns and ulceration because of overexposures uh, in diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and a lot of radiologists, radiologists um, presenting with cataracts and with uh, erythemas and burns on their hands. Th those were things that motivated us. Um, I remember, of course, prior to that, one of the first things we did, Fred Mettler and myself, was produce the document on radiation exposure and pregnancy which was something that was, I think, very much needed at the time. And of course, finally, the need to consider protection of the environment, and we um, enlisted the aid of Jean Pentreef, who I know you uh, are honouring um, today. Jean joined the commission and chaired the then Committee 5, which we established to, to look at environmental protection. So, um, the 2007 recommendations had nearly a decade of uh, transparency and, and stakeholder involvement, and um, it, it takes longer to do things, but the days are gone when uh, you came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone, and those were the recommendations and you expected everybody just to pick them up and use them. So I conclude, President, with the um, thoughts that in 90 years of existence ICRP has sought to use the best scientific data in um, making its recommendations and making them practical. The basis obviously changed as we've had more knowledge. There was a threshold because they didn't know about the stochastic effects early on. And then as time's gone on, the estimates of stochastic risks increased up for cancer, but of course decreased for the hereditary defects. And then um, finally, the Commission has adopted a much more open approach involving the profession which I think has been highly beneficial both ways um, and I think we might expect that to continue in the future and that's 90 years in 39 minutes 35 minutes okay thank you president <laughs>